Hey guys, uh, Brian Castro here with Better Chest Training, and it's good to see you guys again. Uh, it's been several months, I know, since I've uh, downloaded or uploaded a uh, video, but uh, had uh, some family things going on. Uh, nothing bad, just uh, busy with the kids during the summer, as well as the start of the school year, uh, as well as a few non-chess related projects that um, I was working on. So uh, looking forward to maybe um, semi-regularly getting a few videos up. I'm going to try to start on a weekly basis and see where it goes from there. But I did kind of miss uh, putting up the videos and seeing your comments and feedback. So uh, today's video, we're going to be focusing on a game I played, uh, the Team 4545 League, with the underlying uh, theme of playing uh, unorthodox openings, okay? And uh, the reason by, for this is that, uh, well, I'll give you a few reasons, actually. Uh, playing orthodox openings uh, is something that has uh, kind of been debated by uh, masters over the years. There's pros and cons to it, and uh, we'll go over them as we go through the games. Uh, I have a couple different views. Uh, real quick, I'll share. One is an interview I did with uh, international master Greg Shahad. You could find it on my uh, uh, website, betterchesttraining.com, and interviewed him a couple years ago about openings, and he had written an article series saying that, you know, if you really want to become a strong player, you need to play mainline openings. And I agree with him. Uh, however, I think that, uh, and the idea being that, that the main lines are the strongest moves that the Masters have uh, debated over in games, you know, uh, the, the, the Super Grandmasters. And so these are the best moves, so why shouldn't you learn them uh, as a budding uh, ambitious player. Uh, however, uh, we also have to take into account that many of uh, Mr. Shahad's students are strong junior players, uh, ra ratings uh, 2,000 and up, basically. So his audience is a little bit different than maybe the the rest of us. Okay. Um, also, my uh, friend and uh, sometime coach uh, Nigel Davies, uh, Grandmaster, um, we wrote a different. He uh, has a slightly different view in that sometimes um, there are shortcuts you can make with openings because there's many things to study in chess while you're developing, like strategy and end game and tactics, and that you shouldn't be spending all of your time studying the opening. Uh, similarly, uh, you should pick openings that help you to develop certain aspects of your game, like certain positional types. So sometimes playing openings that are, uh, I don't want to say just offbeat, but just openings that are not quite that uh, mainline opening is important and helpful in your development as a chess player as well. So both views, I think, are correct to some extent. Uh, and, you know, let me know in the comments what you think. But anyways, let's get on to the game, and then we could talk a little more about uh, the pros and cons of playing uh, unorthodox openings. Okay. So in this game, uh, start out with d4. Uh, opponent plays d5. I'm going to kind of go quickly through these first few moves. Knight to f3, knight to f6, e3. Kind of aiming for my uh, Kali variation, which I play often. And bishop to g4. So this is the move that kind of sets off uh, the opening variation. If he goes into like c5 um, or e6, then I'm getting more into the Kali structure that you've seen me play in other uh, games on the channel. Uh, here with the bishop to g4 variation, uh, I played it quite a bit, so I'm actually not sure. Maybe I've done a video on this uh, in another game. I have a, a variation I play against it that is not um, the main line, but it gives me a decent position, and we'll go into it right now. I play h3, and of course, if he plays, bishop takes uh, f3, queen takes f3. And then I get the two bishops for almost nothing, and uh, it's not you know it's not horrible for black. My queen is maybe a little um, mispositioned here, but it's not a terrible move, um, or it's not bad by any means. But in in any case, most players um, will play bishop to h5 here, uh, and then I follow up with g4. Now here's where it becomes a little unorthodox because I'm compromising my kingside position, but I have a strategic basis. Uh, behind it. My opponent plays bishop to g6, and I follow up with knight to e5. 
And here is, this is the strategic idea behind this, is that I'm going to win the two bishops, or potentially win the two bishops, as well as have a tactical trap for my opponent, which uh, we will see here. Now, uh, my opponent, by the way, is a stronger player than I am. He's rated about 2,000 fide, and uh, so about 200 points higher uh, than I'm rated. And so... Um, uh, I played him as well before, and I know he's a strong player. So I was very careful during this game. But he played into this uh, opening variation that I know fairly well. Okay. Knight to d7. And here the idea is uh, h4. And if he plays knight takes, then d takes e5. And say he plays something like knight to e4, well, I'm going to win a piece here with h5. He plays it back to knight to d7, same thing. This bishop is trapped. Um, and that's the tactical uh, threat here. But uh, my opponent plays uh, the most common move, which is h6, seeing uh, the threats. And here it gives me the opportunity to win the uh, two bishops as well as compromise my opponent's king side. So uh, this brings me to maybe some, some advice about playing these unorthodox openings, uh, I wouldn't say just play any opening. Like, don't start playing h4 or a4, okay? Uh, you want to play, if you're going to play an ortho unorthodox opening with the idea of shortcutting your studying and learning some different strategic ideas, you want to find openings that have some strategic content to it. Uh, and, and depending on uh, how, I guess you'd say how, uh, how versed you want to become in that opening is will determine maybe how uh, offbeat you want to go, okay? But you want to make sure it's somewhat sound. In this opening and through this game, if you were to run it through an engine, at least the first few moves, uh, even though it is an offbeat opening, uh, it's fairly even. Now, of course, someone might say, well, with white, you want to get a little bit of an advantage. And so with this opening, objectively, I do not gain that advantage, but I maybe have a slight psychological um, advantage or, or psychological uh, uh, benefit from playing this type of opening because my opponent is not as familiar with it as we'll see during this game and maybe gets a little flustered. In fact, I know he gets a little flustered because a little later in the game he uh, gets a little angry and says that my opening is garbage and such. But, hey, you know, when you step at the board, you have to be ready for anything. All right, let's keep going. Uh, let's see here. My opponent, I play uh, bishop to d3 and of course, attacking this g6 pawn, my opponent plays the best move here, king to f7, okay? So you can see here, my opponent, uh, what did I get out of this? Uh, I got some pressure on this pawn, as well as misplacing or displacing his king. It's going to take him some moves to get this rook out if he chooses to do so. I, pull, um, I play c3 next. The idea here is to maybe line up with queen to c2 and attack that pawn. My opponent plays the best move here. E5, I think this is a great move, and it forces me to take because I cannot allow him to uh, close this position or open this e-file easily with, uh, without any compensation. Uh, so I take, and he takes back with the knight. Now he's got two attackers here, so I drop my bishop back, and then he brings his bishop out. Now this gives him, he can bring his rook over here, but also he has some... Uh, uh, discovered maybe pressure here on the h4 pawn. Knight to d2, developing my knight. And here he plays queen to d7, adding a third attacker to uh, this pawn here. Now, I play rook to g1 fairly quickly, uh, partly because I've studied um, this variation before I played this before. And I know that the rook on g1 is very effective because one of my strategic ideas is to maybe push this g pawn to open up the king side at some point. So this is another uh, benefit of maybe playing a little more offbeat opening is that you will be more familiar with the strategic ideas uh, underlying, okay? Uh, one thing I want to caution, though, is that sometimes, I and I, I've had this as well uh, in in my past is that when you play these offbeat openings, sometimes you have this false sense of confidence that you're just going to blow your opponents off the board or that you've surprised him. And so now, you know, you're going to just have an easy game. 
And that's not the case often because, again, these offbeat openings are not necessarily the objectively strongest moves. And so if your opponent is good and, he's, and he takes his time, uh, you know, you will have a fight on your hands. However, you increase your chances, uh, you know, if your opponent's not familiar with it because he's got to do more thinking, which can cause him to use more time on the clock or maybe make some uh, nuanced mistakes that you can take advantage of. So you still need to play chess, okay? So the solution is not a silver bullet saying that, you know, you, you learn these trick openings and then you blow everybody off the board. Um, I look at it as a shortcut because if I study that bishop to g4 line, if I study the main lines, that might take away from some of the studying I might do on some of the more common lines that I will be playing with white. So I use this as a shortcut because I don't really need to study it that much. Uh, because I'm very familiar with uh, the main ideas and uh, can spend more time studying other aspects of chess. Okay. Rook A to E8. Okay, start now his strategic idea here. He's going to start putting pressure down this half open E file. Okay, F4. Now, on the one hand, this E pawn now becomes quite weak, but it's very important for me here to control this e5 square and kick this knight out because this knight is very well positioned if I don't do so. And this also supports an eventual uh, idea of, of maybe g5 or even f5. Knight to c6, dropping it back, and now I can play knight to f3. Now, there's two attackers on g4 and only one defender, but I have a tactical defense or a tactical uh, protection of that pawn here. So if you want, uh, what would uh, you do if um, your opponent played rook takes, or uh, knight takes g4 here? I think I just gave it away. Uh, well, you have rook takes g4, and then if queen takes g4, knight to e5 check. And after knight takes e5, bishop takes g4, knight takes g4, queen takes g4, you are now up uh, quite a bit of material, so you should be able to win this game. However, my opponent is a good player and plays bishop to c5, putting more pressure on this e3 pawn. And I considered how I should defend it. Uh, I was considering things like uh, uh, king to f2, but I didn't like moves like knight to e4 check. So I played what I uh, later analyzing I think is the best move, queen to d3. Okay, so this brings this queen out. I'm starting to look at this pawn now. Uh, starting to look at ideas if I can get a rook here on d1. And starting to put a little pressure on my opponent's position. Okay, knight to e4 is played. And here, uh, it's a well-placed piece. Again, I, I'm, from, I'm aware that I'm giving my opponent some uh, concessions by playing this opening here. Knight to h2. This move uh, I don't think is a very good move. I think my idea during the game was to, I was trying to come up with some type of plan. I have some ideas here. c4 is something I want to play. And I'm thinking I want to shore up this defense. I'm thinking of playing knight to h2 to knight to f1. Maybe going to g3, but maybe to defend this pawn here. My opponent, though, plays bishop to e7, attacking this pawn. And I realize that I need to go back to this position. And then he almost instantly goes back to this position. Well, this gave me time to think of another idea here. Like I said, at some point, c4 is a nice move here, undermining this knight. As well, at the moment, this pawn is pinned because this queen is hanging. So if I were to play c4 and he played this, and of course I'd win the queen, and of course my opponent wouldn't play that. Um, so c4... The problem with it is that I didn't want to worry too much about the complications of bishop to b5 check. Even though I don't think it's super dangerous, uh, I wanted to make this c4 move a little safer. So I prepared it with a3. Okay, so a3 covers b4. So my opponent plays queen to e6, which adds some more pressure here to e3 indirectly as well as gets it off of this file with my queen. I play b4. So I'm pushing this bishop back, but more importantly, I'm threatening b5, which is, uh, this knight here is protecting e5, because I'm now eyeing that for my knight. 
Okay, so it's kind of this uh, position here where you give your opponent a knight outpost and then you get one as well. He plays bishop to b6, dropping his bishop back, and I play a4, threatening to trap this bishop. Okay, now I foresaw the, the, the coming moves here, and he played a6, and I'm not going to push it back. That would really be fairly useless, and I play b5, kicking this knight out. Here he takes, here he takes, and here uh, he has to play here. So he's got this threat here, um, and I will think about dealing it with it shortly, but I play knight to e5 check first, getting this knight to this beautiful square here, and it's going to be very difficult for him to uh, remove it. So his king moves back, and you'll notice here that his rook is trapped now. If you would have uh, maybe taken some time getting that rook out, you can maybe uh, have two active rooks. Bishop to a3. And the idea here is to uh, just get it on a more active diagonal here. Okay, You can see I have to be concerned about c3 at some point maybe. And we'll see that actually uh, that I do. And I also wanted to cover the c5 square where this knight might want to drop back. Okay. He plays uh, his knight to b3, attacking my rook, and fairly simple because I wanted to put my rook here anyway. So now you can see I have two attackers. He's only defending it once. Here, uh, he counters by putting pressure on my pawn, and then I play bishop to b4. Now, if he takes, then I take, and you can see here that this knight is trapped because all of its escape squares are covered by these pawns, and or my rook okay so that would be a bad move so instead he plays c6 hoping to uh, uh, fight back a little bit okay uh, I kind of simplify here but actually uh, I have a little tricky line I did see the themes of this during the game with if you notice this diagonal here and that would be playing something like this queen takes e4 d takes e4 and now bishop to c4 pinning this knight okay now um, he takes then I take back with the knight attacking this bishop twice and now if you were to take C takes before now again this knight is trapped and so I would be winning but uh, so that is uh, one move I saw but uh, I was playing this game late at night so I think I didn't want to calculate all of the variations that could Go from it and instead i want to simplify i took here on a5 and what it does is this knight gets knocked back a little bit and it's now a little off sides for a little bit okay c4 i finally get to play the move i want to uh, if he plays here then again i have that queen takes e4 and then if he takes now i'm winning material because i've won a piece okay uh, if he takes here then, of course, I could just take here, again, threatening bishop takes c4. Okay. Um, and in this case, in this case, uh, I might play something like queen takes c4 instead. But anyways, getting back to it. Uh, he played queen to f6, making a one-move threat here, threatening to this check here on h4. So this was kind of a big decision moment. I took a few minutes to decide what to do here. Because um, with this knight and this queen, this can get quite dangerous as well. In fact, let's say I made a, um, uh, let's see. Let's say I made a, just a silly move here, okay? He gets this check in, and here he's checkmating me. So you can see that this threat is credible. It is something I have to deal with. So I actually play g5 which, again, that was something I was thinking of. The only problem here is it does let this rook out, but I thought it, the taking care of this threat as well as uh, getting this push in was more important. And so analyzing it, uh, I thought it was a pretty good move. H takes g5, H takes g5, he moves his queen back over here, and now C takes d5, okay? Again, you always want to watch your checks here, and I saw that... I saw the following sequence here, queen to b4 check, rook king to f1, and then rook to h2. But I knew that I would be safe after knight to g4. Okay, So here we could say uh, it's a little bit messy, 
but I'm about to get a material advantage here with these pawns. These pawns are, are going to be toast. Uh, these pawns over here. And uh, my pieces are not super well coordinated, but I do have some threats here. This knight can hop back onto e5 at some moment if it doesn't need to protect here. And so I'm looking pretty good. My king is safe. doesn't really have any checkmating threats uh, that are credible. Okay. So he plays an interesting sacrifice, exchange sacrifice. Rooks takes e2. And I was considering uh, how to take back here. And there's one good move to take here. Um, if he plays uh, queen takes e2, what would what do you think black would play here? Pause it and uh, just take 30 seconds. Take a look at that. Okay. If uh, I took here with the queen, then knight to c3 is a little messy. Okay, I move my queen, and he takes. And if I take back with the queen, um, he's taking this pawn with check. Okay, and so now uh, we're getting back into, you know, it's getting a little messy. However, uh, I didn't do that. I played king takes e2, and now I've secured a pretty solid advantage here. I have the exchange, and... Uh, it's kind of difficult for him to win it back. I mean, uh, he plays knight, takes c3, uh, forking my rook and king. But if he takes here on d1, then he's in a little bit of trouble because now uh, I can go on the offensive with something like king, queen takes g6. Now uh, with knight, knight threats here, this rook can come over. Um, and I can get to him faster than he can get to me, I, I guess is the basic idea here. I'm threatening his rook here. Okay, so he, he realized that knight takes d1 is dangerous, so he just dropped back and took on d5. Okay, and here I made a, a mistake. Um, took here on g6. Uh, I think I'm still winning, but I let him get back in here. Uh, better, instead of uh, taking on g6, would be um, maybe... Uh, repositioning my uh, well, actually a few things I could have just brought my knight back over here okay just blocking him here still maintaining this threat and now my rook can come over to h1 uh, this would have been a lot stronger I think uh, or even just something simple like taking here on c6 first and then after he takes then looking at something like uh, knight to e5 okay um, but instead, I take here on g6, which exposes me to some danger, okay? So even though uh, I got an advantage out of the opening or, or from the game, I guess it wasn't just because of the opening, uh, I still have to be careful here. He takes here, rook takes e3, check. Knight takes e3. And uh, what I didn't, I didn't look a move, half move far enough to see this queen takes f4, check. I just saw that I could protect e3. Now, um, there's, again, only one good move in this position. So I'm going to uh, pause the video and uh, take, take a couple minutes and see if you can come up with the best move here. Now, it would be a mistake to play king to e2 because now queen takes e3 check, king to f1, and he has a perpetual check here. Okay? And it's a draw if he wants it. Uh, no real way for him to win because it's a little dangerous for him. But he can draw a game that I should be able to win here. So I made the best move in the position. King to g2. Okay. And uh, very pleased with that move. It was kind of nice here. Even though I give, I'm going to give him back the exchange. Knight takes e3 check. King to h1. And then he takes back here. Um, problem is... Queen to e8, check. Queen takes f8. Queen takes f8. King takes f8. And here I actually could have taken... Um, I could have taken here as well right away. And then if he were to take here, then I'm just going to win these pawns eventually. Uh, let me show you uh, the rest of this game. Here it's a, a pretty clear win for white now. Uh, but I do have to have a little bit of technique. So let me show you what happens. I take here first. Because, of course, he can't move his knight out of the way because I'm going to promote this pawn. For example, if he just moves his knight back, then I'm just going to make a queen. So he takes back. 
and then I take the knight, and then he starts to centralize his king. And what should we do here? We should bring our king to the center as well. Tries to get his knight into play. Uh, threatening checks here, so I just play king to f4 to cover those squares. He brings his king in. And here, um, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I just played this check here because the idea is that if he tries to move forward here with his king to advance this pawn, then I'm just going to grab this pawn. Okay? Um, it's pretty straightforward there. So he goes back to protect this pawn. And now I'm going to win this, this pawn here. Knight to b6. Again, you can see if he plays knight to a5, then I'm just going to attack that knight and win this pawn anyway. So he plays knight to b6. I take knight to d5 check. He gets one check in. Uh, here, I just move out of the way. He's covered. And then he plays out here. And here it's just... Um, it's made in a few moves. G6 check. This is all forced. Of course, if he plays here, then uh, I could just do this. And if he attacks here, I'm just going to take this pawn. Instead, he played king to f8. I just played king to e6. It's now mate in one, and my opponent resigned. So, hope you enjoyed that game. Again, my opponent did get a little frustrated afterwards uh, talking about my garbage opening. And even though he was right, uh, I won the game. And hopefully um, you enjoyed it. And I also hope that uh, maybe you might consider finding some shortcuts into your repertoire uh, in order to cut down on your study time and also to put yourself in some positions where maybe you have a, a better understanding than your opponent. But remember with these unorthodox openings that you still need to play the whole game. You still need to be strong in your tactics and your strategy, and it's not an automatic win. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments about that. Uh, let me know what kinds of openings you play, and uh, hope to see you in the next video. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, trying to get back into... Uh, uploading more regularly. I'm going to aim for once a week. Let me know what kind of videos you want to see. Uh, upcoming, I've got a few uh, master games that I've been uh, analyzing that I want to share with you. Uh, also, uh, eventually, although I'm not, I don't have a, a definite timeline on it, I want to continue with my uh, strategy uh, uh, kind of beginner course that I had started a few months ago. Uh, definitely want to continue and finish that for you. But uh, it's good to be back. And thank you for your patience. Thank you for your support. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, please uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, like the video. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.